to kick off. So um, welcome everyone to this Charge Together Fleet webinar on electrification to automation, smart mobility solutions for councils. Um, the Charge Together program aims to accelerate the transition to electric vehicles. Um, I'm Dan Hilson, I'm the founder and chair of the program. Charge Together is brought to you by the Electric Vehicle Council, sponsored by the Energy and the Australian Renewable Energy Agency. Along with these webinars, we've got tools, knowledge bases and other um, things to help electric vehicles make this transition. So today we've been very focused on electric vehicles for fleets, as is what we, the name, um, and this area poses a lot of challenges and opportunities. We've been focusing on this, but obviously there's a bigger shift or as big a shift happening in the background on the horizon, which is a shift to autonomous vehicles. And um, the future fleet will most definitely involve a large number of smart connected autonomous vehicles delivering the environmental benefits, uh, but also some potential social benefits. So this transition is quite complex. And today we've got some people who are in the thick of it. It's gonna take these types of partnerships to make this happen. The Redland City Coast Smart Mobility Trial was a joint initiative from RACQ, um, Redland City Council with the support of SQQ Council of Mayors. And it's trialed the use of the RACQ Smart Shuttle on the Kangara Island. And it has been driven by Easy Mile um, as the technology and underlying provider, and they're a pioneering driverless mobility uh, with the aim to revolutionise passenger goods transportation. So I will hand over to, um, to Easy Mile, to Greg, to uh, take forward the presentation. Thank you for, thank you for that, Greg. All right, hello everyone, and um, thanks to, uh, to, to Daniel, Alex, and the um, uh, Electric Vehicle Council for, for having us today. Um, as Daniel mentioned, we, we're going to make a side move from uh, electric vehicle today to talk a bit more about uh, autonomous technology uh, and how this technology can provide new mobility solutions that can address uh, some challenges that, that you might see in your local government areas. My name is Reggie Wan, I'm a GPL from uh, Easy Mile in Australia, New Zealand. Uh, as you can tell from the accent, based out of LA, uh, and we also, um, uh, also have a couple of co-presenters with me today uh, on the panel who are kind enough to uh, join the presentation. I just want to acknowledge that and, and thank them as well. Uh, and to start with, I'll just get them to introduce themselves as well. We start with you, Rebecca. Thanks, Greg. Um, my name is Rebecca Michael. I'm the Head of Public Policy at RACQ here in Queensland. And uh, we were pleased to be partnering with Redlands and the support of Easy Mile to deliver Queensland's first uh, full on-road autonomous vehicle trial. Thank you. And uh, we also have Tim from Redlands City Council. Uh, Tim, if you can introduce yourself, I know you're uh, joining the phone. Yeah. yeah. Go ahead. Yeah, sorry, Greg. Um, good afternoon. So, Tim Mitchell. I'm the Principal Transport Planner for Redland City Council. I um, have some computer issues today. Um, so, my role in this project was essentially the, the lead from council part and um, taking on the, the operational uh, side of it. Thank you, Tim. And without further ado, we'll get started. So what we want to cover today is just a, a quick presentation of our um, respective organization. I think it's really important to flag that um, it's not a project where you can go it alone. Uh, and in this project and in all of our projects, you actually have a consortium of, of partners and that uh, collaborative approach is, uh, is very important. So we'll, uh, you, you just hear a bit more about um, who, who we are. Um, then, uh, I think uh, it would be interesting to hear, especially from Redland City Council and RACQ, as to the, the why uh, they decided to embark on, on such an ambitious journey. Because, you know, we're, we're talking about um, groundbreaking energy technology, uh, and they've got a, a good story to tell as to, to why they decided to do this project together. Uh, we'll talk about the project itself. After that, uh, we'll move on to lesson learned and then talk a bit about what's next for um, you know, the next phase uh, of the RACQ Smart Shuttle. 
but I'd also like to open it up a bit more about what's next for uh, autonomous shuttle in Australia by using a, a global case study on the future of, of autonomous vehicle and mobility solutions. Uh, and after that, we'll finish with some question and answers. Um, please make sure that you prepare a question. And presentation, I just send it to you to present everything. Thanks, Greg. Thanks, Greg. Um, I'm not sure if there's any other issues. We're having a few issues, I guess, with audio, um, me particularly hearing uh, what you were saying, Greg, but um, I'm assuming you just said go through this slide. <laughs> so um, I guess just to introduce RACQ, so we're, for those who don't know, um, we're Queensland's peak motoring body with 1.8 million members. So there's effectively an RACQ member in 70% of Queensland households. and. Well, I, I guess it's fair to say, you know, RACQ was born out of the last um, major transport disruption. And that was the transition from horse and cart to vehicles. And we exp are experiencing, obviously, another major shift in transport disruption around um, connected and autonomous vehicles and electrification. And, you know, um, we're looking to be at the forefront of that disruption to make sure that we can actually support our members as they make um, future mobility choices, but also to take an active role in actually ensuring that the technology is safe and to, um, you know, play a role in actually the safe deployment of this technology into our network. And so that essentially is who we are. Um, and it provides a bit of context, I guess, around why we are looking to participate in autonomous vehicle um, trials, particularly around our remit is safe, affordable and sustainable. So we see that autonomous transport, particularly in first and last mile use cases has the potential to address transport disadvantage, improve road safety and provide, I guess, affordable services that may not have been affordable before to um, councils and to, uh, you know, fleet operators. And so that was our reason for coming into this and to explore those use cases and to look at how, you know, those vehicles then interact with other road users um, and understand how people are reacting to those on being on the road. Thanks, Rebecca. I've just killed my video to try to get better sound. Can you can you hear me okay? That sounds yeah. a lot better, Greg. Okay. Internet connection is uh, becoming a rare commodity these days, so <laughs> I'll, I'll continue without the video. Uh, thanks for that, Rebecca. And we'll just move um, on to you, Tim, to present the Redland City Council. Uh, are you still on the line, Tim? Uh, Greg, um, uh, can, you, can you hear me? You are. Yep, we can hear you now. All right. Sorry about that. Okay. Um, so a bit of context for those who don't know where Redland City Council is. Um, we're in southeast Queensland, um, bordering Brisbane, um, as you can see there. So. From a council perspective, our interest in um, this sort of transport mobility is, is to really fill a, a transport gap. So we've got um, an underwhelming public transport um, network in this part of the world. So, and I guess we're also unique in the sense we've got a fairly large island community um, that is pretty much isolated from the mainland. So we as a council, are keen to explore what options are available to you know to really provide a, a transport option to these communities and to test what's viable. Thanks very much, Tim. And um, I'll just go on to to present Easy Mine. Um, so just you know some some quick um, uh, presentation. So we're a small and medium enterprise um, that is about five years old. Um, it's not much from a business perspective, but in the environment in which we evolve and for the autonomous vehicle industry, uh, we're actually quite a mature organization because it's been five years that we're uh, deploying autonomous vehicle and, and learning by doing. 
uh, in what is essentially a, a very uh, emerging industry. Um, we've got about 220 employees globally. Uh, I'd say about 75% of those are on the research and, and development side, um, which is very important to us because um, our, our DNA uh, and our core business is really the technology uh, and the development of this technology. Uh, we also have 30 PhD in, uh, in the team. Uh, because you know this is this is rocket science, and we need a lot of uh, brain power behind the development of, of the technology. Um, despite our young age as a company, we've got quite a, a broad global footprint. Um, our headquarters are in Toulouse, in France, which is also the, um, uh, the where the headquarters of Airbus uh, are located. So it's a good catchment area for us in terms of engineering talent. Um, but we also have offices in the US. We are opening up a branch in uh, Dubai, uh, offices in Singapore. We've got about 30 people and an offshore R&D center. Uh, and of course, offices in Adelaide, where uh, myself and the Australian New Zealand team are based. Uh, it's a privately held company. The majority shareholder is still the original founder of EasyMile, uh, who is still our, our current CEO. Uh, but a couple of years ago, we've opened up our capital to external investors, the like of Alstom, uh, the train manufacturer and public transport integrator. Uh, they're actually based in Brisbane in Australia uh, with a manufacturing plant in Ballarat as well. Uh, and we also have Continental. Now, when you talk about Continental in Australia, we think about the tires straight away. Uh, but it's important to, to understand that the tires is actually a very small part of their business. Uh, the main core business of Continental is really the, the R&D and development of sensors and components for the OEM industry, which is really the part that interests us as, as easy Um and, and I think, you know, in terms of our shareholders, more than just financial investment, what we're after is the, the strategic equity and, and finding uh, partners who share our vision uh, and our technology roadmap as well in the, in the development of autonomous vehicle. Uh, autonomous vehicle product. Um, I'm going to talk a, a little bit about this. I think it's important because, again, it's uh, we're talking about uh, uh, groundbreaking emerging technology here. And I just want to make sure that the, the audience is clear on the, the value proposition of driverless vehicle. Um, firstly, the, the safety component is very important. Uh, currently, every year, Globally, uh, we have almost one and a half million casualties uh, that are linked to, to uh, road accidents. Um, so putting it into perspective, uh, it's like every year you have the population of a city the size of Adelaide being wiped out uh, due to accident. So broad adoption of autonomous vehicle, and I'm talking here you know, very close to 200% to of AV on the road, um, would reduce more than 90% of, of road accidents. And uh, the benefits in terms of uh, pressure on our health system, cost to countries and government are huge. Um, it's a very cost-effective um, cost initiative as well. If you think about transport from a commercial operation perspective, uh, driver cost can cost up to 80% of operating cost in some case. Uh, so by replacing the human driver and automating vehicles, um, you are able to, to uh, have a very big impact on, um, on, on your bottom line. Um, and here, I'd, I'd just like to, to you know, make a side comment. We often get pushed as the AV industry on the fact that we are taking jobs away from the job market um, and that you know, automation is, uh, is going to take these jobs away. But uh, to the contrary, I would argue that um, we are ahead of uh, very big looming issues and gaps in the job, mar job market when it comes to driving. Uh, if you think about drivers for, for uh, train, for buses, for traffic, uh, we're actually having an aging population of drivers because there's less and less people who want to do this job. Um, if you look at freight trucks, for example, the, the average age is, is getting close to 60 years old in Australia. Uh, so I think that, you know, rather than taking job away, we're bringing a solution to, to uh, an upcoming problem uh, and a, a gap in the job market. Uh, obviously, there's some, some value in terms of productivity, flexibility, uh, the fact that AV can, can be more equitable in terms of public transportation, I think is 
um, very important and way too often when we talk about mobility and transport, uh, we tend to focus on urban center. But we also have some very big uh, transport challenges and gap in our regional and rural areas. Uh, Tim mentioned a little bit earlier that um, the city of Redlands is underserviced when it comes to public transportation. Uh, and I think if I think about the Karagara Island, which we will talk about in a few minutes, um, we have a chunk of the, the community on Karagara who have one car to transport them on the island, and they have another car on the mainland at the ferry's arrival so that when they take the ferry, they can use the car on the mainland to go about their business. Um, and I think that, you know, there's a real phenomenon of public transport poverty and, and forced car ownership. Um, these people have two cars because they, they just don't have the choice. Uh, so I think uh, autonomous vehicle shared mobility solution can bring a solution to, to this kind of, uh, of, of challenges as well. Uh, and finally, autonomous vehicles are eco-friendly as well, beyond just the, the question of electric vehicles and pollution, uh, a positive externality of having shared autonomous vehicle feeding and complementing the existing public transit network um, are around congestion. Uh, currently in Australia, the cost of congestion is about 20 billion per year uh, and expected to double by 2031 if no action is taken. So, so the cost is huge. Um, I also think that uh, the rise of shared mobility solution and autonomous vehicle will eventually lead to a, a redesign of our uh, infrastructure and, and public land, um, which, which is a good thing because currently we're still, um, as you know, uh, throwing billions and billions to the development of, of uh, car parks, um, car parks that are being used to park private fleet. And uh, as you probably know, private fleet and, and private vehicles are used less than 10% of time. Um, when you know the, the, the cost of cars, I mean, it, it just doesn't make any sense, um, you know, to, to, to put our, uh, to, to, to buy these cars and put them in an expensive car park. And I think that if we can redesign our public space as well, our cities would become uh, a lot more, more livable too. Uh, so that's just, you know, very quick uh, outlook on, on the benefits. Um, and now, just briefly, I want to present the vehicle that was used for the Karagara Island project, which is the, the Easy 10 uh, Autonomous Shuttle. Now, it's, it's an electric vehicle. Um, and as Dan mentioned earlier in his introduction, um, I think that you know, EV and AV uh, are sharing uh, the, the, the development path. It's important for us as autonomous vehicle um, developers to start from an electric vehicle. Uh, because these vehicles are essentially supercomputers on wheels. You know, they're like rolling supercomputers, and that requires a lot of power and a lot of energy. And electric vehicles provide a, a linear, stable source of power in terms of consistency um, that we do not find on traditional internal combustion engine. So it's important for us to start from uh, electric vehicle. I guess electric vehicles also have lower latency. When you think about the function of a vehicle, like the throttle, the steering, the braking, uh, there's less latency on electric vehicle. Uh, and it's important to have less latency for critical autonomous function as well, especially if you think about braking. Uh, and finally, I think that it's, um, uh, it's just a simpler uh, integration. You know, we can retrofit traditional vehicles uh, but there are some, some complications in around to the mechanical component. We need to retrofit with a drive-by-wire kit to, to, to essentially electrify the function of accelerating, braking, and so on. So uh, it's much easier if we start from a, an electric vehicle to start with. Uh, in terms of capacity, the vehicle can carry up to 12 people. Uh, in Australia, call, make that six people because um, by uh, regulations, all of our passengers need to be seated with seat belt. Uh, the battery autonomy is 16 hours in, in uh, perfect conditions uh, with AC, which is really critical for our Australian environment. You're probably looking at more like 10, 12 hours of operation with the, the AC on. There's a built-in automatic, automatic access ramp, very important for people with reusability and accessibility. No need for additional infrastructure, about from some um, reference points, which are essentially like some uh, uh, road signage, if you like. Um, and the maximum mechanical speed of the vehicle is, is 30k per hour. 
All right, now we'll just move into the, the journey and, and um, you know, again, I think it'd be interesting to hear it from um, uh, Rebecca and team as to why they decided to, to embark on, uh, on, on the adventure. Um, so just hand it over to uh, Tim uh, first, just to, for you to give us the, the Redland City Council perspective. Uh, I think you're on mute, Tim. Uh, yep. Thanks, Thank Greg. Um, yeah, so as I, I touched on earlier, really what council's expectations or um, objectives of this trial is really to, to understand the viability of autonomous vehicle technology in a Redlands Coast perspective. Um, yeah, it's, it's about understanding as well the, the scalability of this technology um, to to test its capability in servicing isolated communities. Um, and then from there, you know, it allows us to, to really develop specific policy um, um, platforms and advocate more broadly to our regulating authorities um, to, I guess, to allow and introduce this sort of um, technology more broadly. So that's, that's where we started this journey or why we started this journey. Thanks very much, Tim. And um, I know that we have a lot of LGA on the in the audience today. Um, it's important to understand that at the time where we need the community acceptance of uh, this technology, it's critical for us to to work closely with council and LGAs and to to bring the community on board so that they can understand the the, the value uh, of such mobility solution. Um, I'll just pass it on to you, Rebecca, to talk about the. AV program. Thanks, Greg. Um, look, as I mentioned before, you know, we uh, consider ourselves, I guess, as a, a steward in this space, and we felt it was important to understand this technology to be able not only put us in a position that we could provide advice to members, we could um, advocate and lobby on these types of technology, but also, you know, understand the various use cases. It was really important when I put this proposition to um, my CEO and board that what they came back was, with was you know, unequivocal support, but they said it had to be a real vehicle performing a real task. And it had to address issues in a transport system now, such as first last mile and our transport disadvantage. So that's where we've come at it from, is understanding what those various use cases are. And we've committed to undertake a five year trial program with a view to increasing the complexity of those trials as we go through. So, you know, we'll talk a bit today about how we've done Karagara Island, and that was a really good stepping off point. And there was a number of unique characteristics about that island and about that trial that made it perfect for the first um, full on-road trial in Queensland. However, we're looking to sort of expand that sort of nascent um, knowledge now. So. For us, um, you know, it's about having those real world use cases and then building on that understanding about how safe they are, how they interact with other road users. And that's really important, particularly um, vulnerable road users and pretty much how suitable it is to Queensland's driving conditions. We hear a lot about, you know, can we actually have autonomous vehicles on Queensland roads? Um, having worked in local government for quite some time, I know that, you know, we've got still 100,000 kilometres of unsealed roads here. Um, the other sort of 50,000 under local government control um, kilometres is, um, you know, of varying standards. So it was about understanding, you know, well, what is that infrastructure standard that do that do we need? And then how do we go about advocating and lobbying for that so that we're autonomous vehicle ready? Thanks, Rebecca. Um, as far as Easy Mile is concerned, in terms of the journey, um, I think that uh, as Rebecca just mentioned, for us, it's really important to start with a, a good and, and meaningful use case. Uh, and that can mean different things depending on what state you're looking at, uh, the kind of project and the expectation of, of the partners as well. Um, but it's always very important for us to, to work closely with LGAs um, and it's often LGAs that provide uh, a solid use case to start with because uh, as part of the council, you know your area better than anyone else and you know where there are parking pressure problem, uh, first and last mile, uh, black spot and, and gaps in the network. 
Um, and I think that Karagara was presenting a, a very interesting uh, use case. Um, the, the other point that I just wanted to make, and I invite Rebecca and team to comment on this after, but um, navigating the, the regulations um, was a very big part of the journey for us, especially in the state of Queensland, where this was the first, um, this was the first such project. Um, and uh, there's no real um, national regulations around autonomous vehicle at the moment. Um, and, and I think that, you know, Rebecca and team will back me up when I said that the, the process to get an exemption on a permit to operate on public road um, is ex extremely tedious and, and non-linear and, and very complex. Um, so, and, and, you know, further to that, I think that um, the fact that we had deployed before in South Australia, New South Wales, Northern Territory, um, doesn't always count. Uh, as you know, different states, sometimes they, they operate a bit like different countries. Um, and although we, we have demonstrated the safety case um, in close to 250 projects globally, uh, we still had to buy an inflatable kangaroo to show that you know the vehicle will stop before it hits a, a, a static object. So uh, I, I don't know if Tim or Rebecca, you wanna talk a bit about the, the regulation slide here, if you have any comments. I think, um, Greg, we kind of, we will sort of cover off on that as we go through the journey sure. process. It was a very, um, I guess, complex process, but one that is, you can navigate, but there are some, you know, sort of conditions around that that make it easier than, than um, you know, could make it easier than, than not. And I think, the, you know, as we'll go through, you know, it is about having partnerships, being flexible, having a good working relationship and being prepared to adapt and to change. And, um, you know, hats off to Redland City Council who demonstrated what I consider to be like a, a best in class approach to this. Um, and we'll sort of go through that in a bit more detail as we go through. Sure. Um, okay, now we'll, we'll just talk, talk a bit more about the, the uh, Redland Coast Smart Mobility Trial, which was taking place on the island of Karagara. Uh, and Tim, I'm going to hand it over to you to present, starting with the beautiful and exotic location in the island of Karagara. Thanks, Greg. Um, so that's a few nice pictures of Karagara. So I guess where it sits in the southern Moreton Bay Island area, it's the smallest island uh, and has the, the lowest population. So uh, about 200 people um, permanently live on the island. It um, presented itself as a for many reasons, uh, an ideal first deployment location. So it's a small flat island, um, mostly sealed roads um, of reasonable standard, um, considering it's an island location. Um, it's also the big thing for us, it's outside of uh, the service contract area. So in Queensland, our um, state government agency, um, Department of Transport and Main Roads, um, and then through Translink, um, have contract areas where uh, you know, essentially service providers bid on tenders to operate the, the public transport network. So um, for the case of the Southern Bay Islands, they're all outside of the, those contract areas. So that really just let us um, avoid uh, and an extra body of work to justify deploying. So it, in the grand scheme of things, it, it made made it easier to prepare an application, but it, it by no means was um, a simple process. Okay, I'm just moving on to the next uh, slide, Tim. Mm -hmm. All right, so I, I guess where we're at now, so, the vehicle arrived, uh, we launched. So we started actual operations in uh, late 2019, in November. Um, so yeah, up leading up to that date was a fairly, a fairly large body of work. So we actually secured our uh, the conditional permit from TMR in January that year. Um, and then probably count back about well, six to eight months before that was when we started the application process. So it was a fairly long burn to, to get to that uh, operational date. Um, so 
it was a, a significant milestone for us as a council, but also the project team um, to to get up uh, in time to, to meet that um, operational time frame. So we set out for a six month uh, service, which um, was going well. Obviously, the the COVID nineteen our situation did throw a spanner in the works, but that was you know, beyond our control. So start date November, and then we'll run away, which was great. So running a, a full timetable. Um, that's where we were. All right, so I have a few more details about the route. So like I said, so Karagao is a fairly, it's a small flat island. Um, the route we chose was, it, it, it was an up and back route essentially. So starting at the ferry terminal where obviously the objective was to, to meet the ferries, um, um, traveling to the end of the island and then back again. So in total, it was 3.6 kilometers. Um, Public road, so live traffic. Um, predominantly, it's a lower speed limit on the island, so um, signposted for 40 kilometres an hour. A few uh, intersections along the way, so mainly in the, the middle of the route, we can see the, the yacht club, so you know, basically a, a right and a left turn. Um, and then, yeah, so the, the way we were conditioned to operate the service was a uh, was sub, subway style or metro. Um, mode. So essentially there was uh, six stops along the way. Um, the bus would stop at each stop and then move on. And so that was actually part of our, our conditional permit. Um, so would you like me to carry on? With this part, Greg or Rebecca? Yeah, yeah sure. I just moved to the, the project um, section and you know, the, 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 the processes and the, that you had to go through as a, as a council for this project. Yeah, so for council, our, our interest began this project um, probably it was early 2018 when Easy Mail first came to, to South East Queensland. Uh, and I believe that. Then from a visit from our councillor mayors going to Singapore, um, which gave you an, an opportunity or invited Easy Mom to come to Brisbane to meet some some interested councils, which I was fortunate enough to be there. Um, and we invited Easy Mom rep at the time to come and check out some spots. We thought uh, the AV would um, would work, would be an interesting test case, and Karagara just happened to be one of those locations. Um, Moving on, I think really this project wouldn't have happened without RACQ coming to the table. Um, it's as, as simple as that really. As a, a council, I don't think we would have ever been able to um, take on the, uh, I guess, the ability um, to cost-wise to assume the cost um, and all the other things that went when went into um, securing vehicle um, if it wasn't for ICQ. So at the time when we basically convened as a project team, I guess it's important to, to define the objectives. So, and there's, there's differing objectives, right? So there'll be project specific objectives, which Rebecca and I've touched on previously, but there's also organizational objectives. So um, for council, we, we have, um, I guess an interest in the, the scalability and some locations where we think this sort of technology could work um, and RICQ also um, ha have their own uh, interest and objectives. So it's about understanding that and also just being appreciative, appreciative that I guess it's two different organisations. Um, Within that, I guess the first step for us was just to establish those arrangements and protocols. So, um, you know, the project roles and responsibilities was, was a pretty significant part to the early um, stages of the project. Um, being, uh, I guess, a, a fairly large um, project team, there was a lot of um, interested parties. So there was a lot of different 
tasks happening concurrently. So we have to have a lot of trust in each of the, the members and the project partners that everyone was doing uh, what they're supposed to do, and you know, everyone was focused on achieving that end goal, which initially was um, securing a permit, which was a real unknown at that point in time. Uh, which which probably leads in effectively to um, because we were in an unknown situation, and it was important for us to really engage with those key stakeholders. So, you know, mainly at the start being uh, the the transport and main roads uh, team who would effectively responsible for issuing a permit um, and understanding. Uh, I guess the first instance was their appetite to even uh, consider this sort of project. Um, and then from there, constant back and forth and uh, collaboration as to what sort of documentation they would like to see to feel comfortable with um, issuing a, a conditional permit. Um, and you know, from there, we also needed to engage with, um, you know, like Queensland Police, um, who need uh, permits from them to deploy on the road. Um, so there was a number of interested parties. Um, and then as a team, uh, you know, it, it came down to also defining suitable locations where we, where we, where we felt our deployment would be successful. Um, I guess Carragher was always one we thought would be an interesting place to deploy uh, for a number of reasons. It's an ideal location to trial the sort of technology, but you know, on the other hand, there's also there's a number of um, aspects to the location that make it a challenging um, uh, place to deploy an AV, which you know came to light probably as we were operational. Um, but nevertheless, I think Karagara was a, was a great location for the first deployment because um, it gave us a really good place to test the capabilities um, and how an AV operates. But also being an isolated area, it also gave us the ability to, um, uh, to test the waters, I suppose, to an extent. So being tucked away there, we were able to really um, you know, get used to the vehicle and understand it how it was without being an overly visible um, deployment, which made I guess made it somewhat of a more positive outcome. Um, and look, I, I think given the the time of the project went, it's important to understand that the, the project plan and scheduling are essentially live documents, so they're going to change throughout. There's going to be tasks that come up. Um, there's going to be um, time frames are going to shift depending on what happens. So, uh, as Rebecca mentioned before, it's key to be adaptable and flexible in a project like this because it's such a dynamic space. Greg, just before just before we go on, I think um, just the only other point I would make for, um, to, to what Tim said there was that um, it's important to also note that in pretty much every other trial across Australia, the uh, regulating authority has been a partner to the trial. And that has been a huge advantage because, you know, it enables you to get exemptions and things like that. Um, we didn't have that situation here. I think we were probably one of the first where we did not have the regulator. The regulator decided to act as a regulator, not a partner, and that's fine. Um, and they were a very engaged um, sort of regulator and through the process. But it meant that we had to, we didn't have that, um, that safety net of having the regulator as a partner to be able to get around some things. And and I will tell you, in, in actually getting the first permit and going through a framework that hadn't yet been um, decided, there were, um, I guess, uh, logic problems and um, impossible logic um, sort of situations that came up. For example, uh, you know, we won't, we won't tell you what types of um, tests we want the vehicle to do until you tell tell us what vehicle you're getting. And we would say, but we can't order a vehicle until you, we know what the capability it is that you wanted to be able to test. And so things like that actually took 
probably six weeks of going round and round trying to highlight that that was a logic problem. Similarly, engaging with police who had to provide a permit, police couldn't provide the permit until the vehicle was registered. To get registered, we needed the police to provide the permit. And so those kinds of logic problems kept popping up and just meant that we had to be innovative and, and you know, good negotiators to kind of get around that, which I think has strengthened our position and has actually helped shape the um, framework for permitting now, but um, was challenging at the time. Yeah, and I, 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 um, I back you up on that, Rebecca. I can confirm that um, you know you, you're the only state um, in which uh, an entity, a private entity like RACQ, uh, decided to, um, in partnership with Redland, to take the lead and bring the technology in the state, which I think is um, makes it an even more admirable undertaking because um, in South Australia or New South Wales, for example, we had state government who decided to sponsor project. Um, and, and be a part of the of the consortium uh, as a partner, which which you know really facilitated some of this regulatory dealing as well. Um, I'm just going to move on to the next slide, Tim. Just uh, you know the, the pre-deployment and operations checklist. If you want to go through this briefly. Yeah. Thanks, Greg. So I suppose the best way to go through the, the whole project is to break it down into three, three stages. So we've got you know, the pre-deployment, deployment, and the operational aspect. So for pre-deployment here, we're going to start from after we secure the permit and the vehicle's all ordered and on its way. So what we needed to do um, was obviously being a isolated island with not a lot of um, infrastructure. So we had to um, prepare the site. So in addition to all the traffic management stuff that we needed to do, um, as well as you know, installing bus stops uh, and, and whatnot, so we need to actually build a temporary shelter for the vehicle, uh, a powered little um, lockable uh, shed, essentially, or carport, um, for it to have a home for six months. Um, the big thing as well is community engagement. Ideally, um, you know, for this sort of thing, you'd engage the community a lot earlier. Um, you know, basically, you'd want to engage them at the start. So, you know, you, you're essentially empowering the community to be involved in the project and be part of the, the decision making to a certain extent, particularly you know, for things like group alignment and whatnot. Um, we couldn't really do that this project, or we basically because of the, I guess it was an unknown that we didn't secure a permit. We didn't want to go and engage the community extensively for something that might not happen because that creates that animosity there and, and distrust, um, and even just the time frame. So, like I said, we're, we're talking at least 12 months from when we started. Thanks, thanks very much. Did you want to add me, me? Oh, sorry. <laughs> um, yeah, so, and just logistics. So once the vehicle is, um, is there, uh, or on its way, we have to prepare the site. So deployment, um, once the vehicle arrived, it was a fairly jam-packed schedule from getting it all wrapped and ready to go and looking nice um, to testing the vehicle in a dynamic test, which took it. We scheduled a couple of days, but it only ended up taking a day with, with our team on site and operator training. So the big lesson from us is, you, is in, or recruiting suitable people who could be actually, who could pass the test to become operators in a short amount of time. So you're effectively learning how to operate an entirely new vehicle in the space of a week. Um, and then, so the operational Part. So that was um, resource intensive for, for us. Um, so that basically um, for council to take it on, we're not a service provider, so it was an entirely new set of skills for us. Um, and that just was a very hands-on process to ensure that you know, basically the vehicle was doing as it was supposed to do. Um, it was operating as a schedule to operate. Um, you know, ongoing community engagement and contact points, um, the research component to it, uh, and basically um, troubleshooting. Uh, or resolving any issues as they as they were right as they arose. So yeah, as a, I guess the project lead, you're, you're basically on call 
throughout the entire um, the deployment or trial. Okay, yeah. Can I just add to that thing that um, I think a big part of the difference with this project as well is that the, the Redland City Council was the service and project operator, um, which wasn't the case up to this point for other projects in Australia, uh, where typically you would have a, a public transit operator um, as the service manager um, because you know, the, the customer focus expertise uh, that, that we simply don't have uh, as easy mind. I think in the case of Karagawa, the um, environment was probably a bit uh, more controlled and simplified. Uh, and I guess the benefit from the council as well is to stay of control, stay in control of the uh, the messaging and being very close to to what's happening from a service perspective. Um, but it's a little bit different from other project. Um, and it is, you know, it is it is a big job to to managing operations of, of any public transport service. Mm. Yeah, that's true. And to be fair, Greg, um, and to everyone else, Council wasn't intending to be the service provider. We were looking to engage um, someone, but, and it comes back to the being flexible. It didn't work out, um, you know, through the training and rec um, operator recruitment, it, it wasn't successful. So Council had to step in and um, basically figure out a way forward in a, in a very short space of time to keep the project alive. So um, it's just how it eventuated really. Um, I'll just move on to the next slide, except you, did you want to add anything, Rebecca? No, that's, that's fine, Greg. Okay. Um, so that, that's just, you know, the, the outcome. And as, as Tim uh, mentioned earlier, the, the project was cut short by a couple of months due to COVID. Um, but in the end, the vehicle traveled more than 1,200 kilometers and carried 750 passengers. Now, from a, a rural area perspective, especially an area where the community has no public transportation behavior uh, ingrained, um, this number of passengers are actually pretty good. Uh, if, if you're familiar with public transport in regional area, I can tell you it, it is a challenge. And there's that constant chicken and egg story as well, where um, uh, people are using cars because there's no other option, and there's no other option because everyone has a car. Um, there was also a, a research piece that was uh, led by RACQ with the help of um, the University of Sunshine Coast. Uh, and it's very important at this stage of the development of AV that we collect as much qualitative data uh, and also as a way to prove, you know, to, to prove the business case for AV. Um, and there's some very important stats here, and I'll, I'll invite Tim and Rebecca to comment in a minute, but um, so, so you've got, um, you know, the, the average uh, age, uh, and I think it was quite uh, in line as well with the, the age of the population uh, on Karagawa Island. Um, the journey purpose, 43% uh, of, of passengers surveyed um, came to visit the island, and interestingly, 93% uh, actually came to experience the shuttle. Uh, and I think it was very interesting for us to see this phenomenon of tech tourism, where we had people traveling from Brisbane, uh, who actually have an online influencer who took a 10 minutes video uh, in the vehicle, posted it, commented on it. So, so there was a bit of that tech tourism phenomenon and it was actually bringing people to the island, which is a positive externality if you're trying to um, uh, bring some, you know, additional visitor or tourists, I guess. Um, it was good to see that overall the, the feedback um, was that uh, people felt safe and that they could trust the vehicle and that 93% of users would recommend the shuttle to someone else. Extremely important at the time where we need the community acceptance and the public's vote. Um, and what we find generally in this project is um, globally, and it's true for Australia as well, we have about two thirds of the population that don't trust driverless vehicles at this stage. Uh, and I think there's some reasons behind it. You know, obviously the industry has been overhyped. Um, there's been a couple of incidents in the US as well. Uh, but what we have found is that the people who, uh, who, who you know, come as passenger on board our vehicle, their perception actually flip. Uh, and in some services, up to 80, 90% of the people who use the shuttle after using it say that they would be ready to use driverless vehicle on a regular basis. And, and this is why this project are, are so critical at this point in time as well, to, to bring the community uh, on board the journey. 
uh, in terms of the results, something that's that's uh, absolutely essential here, uh, that's not on the slide, but Rebecca uh, spoke a bit about this earlier. Um, the project also enabled to create uh, a framework, uh, a regulatory framework uh, for the deployment of autonomous vehicle on public roads in, in Queensland. Uh, very important at a time where, um, I guess, the deployment uh, of AV and the regulatory uh, regulatory uh, side are intimately intimately linked together, uh, and they will follow each other uh, until we, we reach scale up and, and commercial model. Uh, and finally, I guess that's more of a positive externality of this kind of project, but uh, it creates quite a bit of, of buzz um, uh, around the, the service. Um, for the launch, we had the, the Sunrise uh, Channel 7 Sunrise Morning Show. They actually did a, a four-minute uh, piece on, on the project. Uh, and the, the mayor of Redland City Council was there, Rebecca was there, I was there myself. And um, the, the video is, is actually pretty good. So I'd invite you to, to search for that video online and view it because you can see the, the technology and service in action. Uh, and there's some very good comments from City of Redlands and RACQ as well. Um, Rebecca, would you like to add anything here? Uh, no, Greg, I think you've covered that off, other than just to say, um, from memory, in terms of media exposure for the trial for Redland Coast, um, we had almost 90 different um, media mentions with an audience of 4 million. So um, these trials do get a bit of attention and um, that can be useful for um, councils as well. Thanks, Rebecca. I'm just conscious of time and wanting to leave enough time for, for mm. questions. Um, I'll just move to lesson learned and what's next. Um, do you want to go through this one, Rebecca? Yeah, sure. Thanks, Greg. Um, I think there were some really key lessons that emerged throughout the trial. And the first one I would say is about a, um, a partnership approach is critical. RACQ couldn't have done it on our own. Um, I don't, Redlands couldn't have done it on their own. We both brought um, a particular skill set to the um, to the trial, and through you know constant communication, uh, being really open and honest, transparent, working with Easy Mile. Look, we, we had to. We were meeting on a on a, month, a weekly basis um, to work through what had changed, what do we need to do differently, what are the next steps. You know, so that partnership approach is really really important. Um, and I'd encourage anyone who's thinking about doing um, one of these trials to, to look at a partnership and look at partners who have, might have like-minded objectives in mind. Um, everything will take longer. Everything will take twice as long um, as you think it will. That's why you need a dynamic um, project plan um, that, you know, is a living document. Um, and that's not through any, anyone's fault. It's just you know, the vehicle might be being shipped or you're relying on the permit or, you know, um, you don't know how long it will take to do the dynamic tests, you know, things like that. Everyone's learning and so you just need to make sure you don't rush it because if you rush it, then the whole project will be compromised. To Tim's point earlier, it is not a linear um, operation. You will have multiple tasks operating concurrently um, and that you'll need to be able to manage. So that's where your partnership arrangement is really, really important and you need to be able to have a very, we had um, a, a Redlands um, uh, project manager Sally on board who really ran a tight ship kept a very good um, a sort of Gantt chart going and honestly it was it was critical to ensuring that all these tasks were happening um, because that a lot of them were dependent so you needed to make sure that you were able to do them at the same time. Um, in terms of those barriers um, they will happen and you know I, I would say uh, someone might have made the point before it sounds very complex and costly uh, it was costly, it was complex, but it also was, it was something that you could navigate through. And, you know, um, I think now that um, the team from Redlands who in their permit process is now being used as the basis for um, permits in Queensland, that is a really positive thing for local government because this is a local government that's just helped shape that permit framework. And so, yes, um, it is, you know, quite complex, but, you know, you can work through that. Um, keep focused on those goals and objectives because when the barriers come, when the complexity comes, when you have those sort of issues arise, it'd be very easy to say, well, let's just not do that part. 
But at the end of the day, you need to be able to tie your outcomes back to your original objectives. We're doing this to actually look at these use cases and we need to commit and to stick to it. And that's where allowing enough time is important to work out solutions to some of those issues as they come up. And to underpinning, I guess, everything that I've just said before, and which has sort of, you know, been the recurring theme throughout this presentation, flexibility and adaptability will help keep them moving that project forward. You know, there will be a way out, but you just need to look at, okay, well, how can we as a team and a partnership get to that next goal, um, given the current situation? And, um, you know, TMR is an extremely supportive regulator. So, again, it's just about having constant and con um, transparent communication. Oh, I think I see Greg's just got another bit down there about our next deployment. It's probably not something we can talk to about too much. Obviously, we've had to take the shuttle off Karagara early um, because of the um, pandemic and the social um, distancing restrictions. However, we are now looking to increase that complexity. Karagara was a very good stepping off point. As an island, it's almost a sandboxed environment, which was about the risk appetite that TMR had at the time. But they can see the vehicle safe. They can see that Redlands have an extremely um, you know, robust process for ensuring the safety of the community in deploying this vehicle and so we are looking to increase complexity nighttime running on demand running um, you know uh, another first last mile solution um, connecting another mode uh, to a key area in the redland area these are all things that we're really excited to be working through um, next and we're hoping that we very shortly we'll be able to announce a few more australia first when it comes to the next trial all right okay thanks very much guys that was really fascinating i really appreciate your time and obviously, like I said up front, we probably were more interested in hearing from you than, um, than other webinars because it's quite a new topic and I think a lot of people would have got huge amounts of value out of that. It's um, fascinating area and having trailblazers like you solving all these problems is incredibly important for others who now want to do it. So we will definitely, um, we will definitely send this uh, out uh, widely and you know, hopefully those on, on the call will also share it. I think it's quite a unique experience that we've heard today that really is globally leading and you, know, you couldn't hear this stuff very often anywhere. So thank you so much for that. Um, all of you, Greg, Rebecca and Tim. Um, the next webinar on the 25th of June is with Hyundai for Fleets. So obviously a leader in the space and you know, it'd be quite an interesting one. Um, I'm sure you can see the, the email addresses of the guys up there. And if you have other questions, then please, you know, I'm sure they'll be happy to get in touch. And, um, and hopefully we see some more of these trials around Australia. So yeah, thanks very much, guys. Thanks, guys. Um, if you guys want to stay on, I don't know if any of you have time, but if anyone has a question, I just wanted to end on time, but I, um, does anyone want to stay on? Do any of you guys have time to stay on? If there's any questions from anyone out there? I certainly had some questions, but... Um, yeah, I can stay on. Yep, I can stay on then. Sorry, I've got another meeting at starting at three, so I'll have to duck off. Apologies. That's right. Well, we might just record some questions and then the video editor can merge them in. Um, yeah, so I guess the main one, Greg, of all of this was really just on the electric side. Um, you know, was there any sort of lessons around scheduling and charging and this that sort of aspect at all? I mean, is there, what's your sort of long-term vision for, I mean, just particularly kind of, I guess, for this forum, you know, what is your long-term perspective on the future of how this will plug into the grid and kind of be orchestrated? And, um... Yeah, it's a, it's a good question, Dan. I think at the moment, because of the, the, the current scale of, um, uh, you know, the autonomous vehicle deployment, um, it's, not, it's not a very big uh, problem yet. Uh, and because, you know, we, we run on um, uh, daily services with, um, uh, you know, on a predefined path, with predefined hours of operation, um, you know that gives us enough regularity to uh, organize the charging, do some opportunity charging in between if, if, if need be. So, at the moment, you know we, we don't really have any charging problem. We don't need any specific infrastructure uh, for these vehicles. You can just you know charge them on a on a, on a regular uh, grid power point. Um, but, you know, I guess th these problems are, are starting to form for us um, in the material uh, handling uh, space. You know, we, we don't just look at, at transport of people as easy mode. We're also in the process of developing platform for uh, material handling. We just developed a, a tow tractor, uh, a robotized tow tractor, similar to the baggage tractor that you see on airport. 
Um, and for this market, uh, typically the, the partners and clients want 24-7 and 100% of time. Uh, and that pushes us to develop, um, uh, you know, I guess, new charging facility. We're looking at lithium battery, uh, potentially induction charging at some stage in the future. Uh, so for this kind of environment, it makes sense to, to innovate from the charging perspective. And then at a later stage, we could bring that in for the transport of people uh, platform as well. Yeah, I mean, certainly in the future, you kind of imagine cars, autonomous vehicles sort of charging themselves and driving between different, um, I mean, I've certainly seen some examples of that. So it's, it's a potentially a really good one for grid integration. So it's you know, part of the question. And uh, I mean, I guess, you know, if, if this all sort of scaled up to the ultimate point, like what would it look like in a fully scaled, you know, implementation of this, say, in, in Queensland? Yeah, sure. So um, I actually had a slide, but we, we ran out of time, but I guess we could share the presentation. But, um, you know, we're seeing in, in other uh, countries, in, in some of our growth market, um, we're, we're really seeing uh, these countries moving into the next phase of deployment uh, and not just deploying vehicles one by one in innovation project, but actually deploying fleet of autonomous vehicles, uh, small fleets, you know, we're talking about five, six vehicles uh, in a real commercial service settings uh, and providing first mile, last mile and, and new transport connection to some communities. Uh, in Australia and especially in Southeast Queensland, we're seeing some strong interest from uh, master plan community. Uh, and we think, you know, this is where we could see the next, um, you know, the next level of deployment because obviously this uh, master plan community have pressure on how they develop the land. Uh, and as I've mentioned earlier, developing car parking spaces is not uh, a good use of, of land. Instead of that, if you can pro propose alternative transport solution, then you know that could help developer looking at it uh, in, in a different way. And I think you know that's when it would become interesting as well from energy provider, um, you know, and, and especially renewable energy provider who have been contracted to provide uh, electricity for these master plan communities. You know, they can take into account the charging infrastructure required for AV, for EVs. Um, and, and, you know, I think that naturally it will bring the next level of innovation in AV to Australia as well. This specific project that you're seeing on screen at the moment, they're starting with six um, uh, shuttles, but they're looking at deploying a 12 meter bus, as you can see on the right hand side of the screen in 2020, an autonomous vehicle, a 12 meter bus. Uh, so I think if you have a strong long term vision like that, naturally you get the next round of innovation that, that will follow. Great. Okay. Well, look, thanks a lot for your time. I'm going to jump, jump off as well. But um, yeah, we'll put that up and, and uh, share it widely. Thank you so much. Thanks, for that. thanks very much, guys. And don't, don't hesitate to send us questions by email or, or LinkedIn. Great.